Okay, so welcome to this new class. Um, so in the last uh, class, we were uh, determining the limiting conditions to determine the equilibrium diagram of concentration versus partial pressure. So the first condition we took was uh, low pressure of oxygen, that is when oxygen deficiency dominates, that is oxygen vacancies dominate in this particular material. Uh, and then charge neutrality, you can establish the charge neutrality condition where oxygen vacancy concentration is half of electron concentration and which is uh, much higher than interstitial concentration. And then you can determine what is the concentration of all the defects and then uh, I can work out uh, since VO is much greater than OI, I can work out what is the PO2 condition at which this should happen. Okay? So, this is first limiting condition. Second limiting condition would be in high pressure region. So, in this case uh, opposite prevails that is oxygen interstitials are much larger in concentration than oxygen vacancies. Again write down the charge neutrality condition and write down uh, derive the concentration of all defects and then we work out what is the partial, what is the regime of partial pressure of oxygen which is given in terms of k k's of different reactions. So, P O 2 must be larger than 16 k f cube much larger than 16 k f cube divided by k o i square. And then the last region which is remaining is um, the stoichiometric condition. In that case we take two conditions case 1 when intrinsic ionization dominates that is uh, intrinsic uh, creation of electrons and holes. In such a situation uh, the electron and hole concentrations are equal they are equal to k to the power half and these two concentrations are much larger than oxygen interstitial and oxygen vacancy concentration. So, when you determine VO and OI concentrations, uh, then NE is given by this expression. So, here uh, as a result oxygen and uh, oxygen vacancy and oxygen interstitial concentrations are vary as P to a minus half P to a plus half in the intermediate range. Second scenario that we could take was uh, when anti Frankel defects dominate, that is in that case vacancy of uh, oxygen is equal to vacancy of int uh, oxygen interstitial which is equal to k f to the power half and these two are much larger than electron and hole concentration. So, we work out from the reduction and oxidation reactions the electron concentration and hole concentration. Uh, the only uh, thing you do here is because V O and O i is now fixed as k, k f to the power half, you replace these as values of V O and O i in, in the expressions which are shown below and then you can work out what is the um, what is the concentration of electrons and holes which goes as p to power minus 1 by 4 or plus 1 by 4. And if we combine all these three regions with the limiting conditions, we get a equilibrium diagram which is called as Brewer's diagram. So, first one is when internal disorder dominates. So, I first draw N e is equal to N h in the stoichiometric region, then I extend N e and N h into high and low pressure regions whose expressions are given as the expressions we have worked out. And then accordingly we can also draw uh, OI and VO concentrations, this is OI and VO concentration. So, OI concentration we start drawing from uh, high pressure region because we know that it is equal to half of N H and then we uh, then the since the continuous composition has to be continuous it varies as uh, P to power plus half in the stoichiometric region and then again varies as 1 by 6 in the low pressure region. In case of VO it is equal to half of N E and this goes as minus 1 by 6 in the low pressure region followed by minus 1 by 2 in the stoichiometric region followed by minus 1 by 6 of P O 2 to the power of uh, P O 2 to the power of minus 1 by 6 as in the high pressure region. So, this is the diagram that you get when you uh, uh, when, when you assume that internal disorder dominates in the material. Uh, on the contrary, if you have anti Frankel disorder which dominates in the intermediate P O 2 range, then the stoichiometric composition uh, stoichiometric state is or intermediate pressure state is governed by O i is equal to V o and then you extend O i and V o into high and low pressure regions according to the expressions that we worked out previously. And then since we know N e is, e is equal to 2 of V o, N h is equal to 2 of O i, we draw the lines for both uh, N e and N h uh, as per the slopes that are obtained in each of these uh, regimes. So, these are two equilibrium diagrams that we developed and these are very easy now as you can see they look complicated, but they are much more easier to derive if you know the fundamentals well if you write the defect reactions properly. And uh, 
we also and choice of internal anti Frenkel or Schottky defects or uh, whatever uh, the, the kind of defects which prevails in the intermediate PO2 range usually uh, those defects are the defects which prevail in the low or high pressure regime. So, your intermediate uh, so for example, for example, if an oxide is prone to having Schottky defect in that case the intermediate pressure re intermediate PO2 range would be V O is equal to V M. So, the imp so the defects that would dominate in the uh, low and high pressure regime would be either V O or V M. So, you do not have O I or M I. So, that is how it would change or if you had Frenkel disorder dominating then you would have V M and M I. So, the kind of defects which are going to dominate in each of these regime are governed are uh, to a large extent governed by what is the situation in the intermediate PO2 range and that makes our life much more easier. So, as you can see if you write the defect reactions properly if you if you work out the limiting conditions then you can work out what is the diagram uh, Brewer's diagram for um, which which is nothing but log of concentration versus log of PO2. And the top part of this if you look at the top part top part of this diagram for example, if I and this was the exercise which I gave you which hope you follow and then top part of this diagram would go as if you. So, basically no matter what the top part of the diagram would look like this. So, when you may now top part of the diagram is basically the majority concentration. So, this is the, uh, regime 1, regime 2, regime 3. So, let us say in this regime you have V O, in this regime you have O i, in this regime O i is equal to V O. Okay. So, when you make conductivity measurements, conductivity measurements in so this is P O 2 on log scale and this is concentration. So, when you make conductivity measurements, so now if I make conductivity measurements, then conductivity measurements would depend uh, would scale as similar manner. So, from the conductivity measurements you can work out what the defect uh, scenario in each of these materials going to be which makes uh, life uh, relatively easier because uh, and in this of course, the temperature is constant these all these measurements are done at constant temperature. So, I hope the situation is clear now uh, with respect to defect equilibria. Now, what we will do is that we will look at the comparative performance of couple of oxides uh, uh, versus oxygen pressure what happens in uh, two different materials let us say at different oxygen partial pressures. So, this is here this is uh, so what we will do is that comparison of two oxides ok. So, we will take uh, MgO and T i O 2. So, first we will take the case of M g O. Okay. Now, M g O if it is uh, pure form then intrinsic defects are uh, as we know we have talked about Schottky defects. So, M g O is prone to most of the closed packed materials are prone to having Schottky defects which means V M G and V O these are two dominating defects. Okay. So, what would be the defect reaction under oxidizing conditions? So, under oxidizing conditions you will have oxygen coming into the system and this would go to oxygen site. Now, you have created one oxygen site compensate for that you will have one magnesium site which would be vacant and that will give rise to two holes. So, this would be the defect reaction and K for such a reaction would be K ox let us say this would be V m g multiplied by n h square divided by P o to the power half if o o was equal to 1 if I take a dilute solution. Now, K experimental value for this reaction is 7.2 into 10 to the power 63 to exponential of 
minus of 610 plus minus roughly 10 percent 680 divided by R T and this is kilo joule per mole. Okay, this is the experimental value of K and the units are centimeter to the power minus 9 m p a to the power minus half. Okay. Now, you can see from this expression that what happens as you increase the temperature. Now, as you increase the temperature, since this is minus sign is here, the k value also increases. As a result, what it means is that that MgO can be oxidized at higher temperatures, which means producing more and more intrinsic magnesium uh, vacancies and holes if no other defects were present, if no other extrinsic defects were present. So, from the electrical neutrality condition, you can write. electrical neutrality condition gives you N H is equal to 2 of V M G. Okay. So, uh, let us take two, two examples of different temperatures. <coughs> so, let us I mean even though in, in reality even though the concentrations are very small, but they still vary as a function of partial pressure of oxygen as well as temperature. So, for example, we take melting point of T M of M G O is about 2480 degree 2480 Kelvin. So, let us say T is equal to 0.8 of T m okay. and atmosphere is air which means 0.21 P O 2 is equal to 0.21 atmosphere. Under these conditions V m g can be worked out as So, uh, you know what the temperature is, I can just put the value of temperature here to get the value of K and I know from the previous slide that K is equal to V m g n h square by P a to the power half. So, I replace n h is equal to 2 V m g which means this whole expression becomes 4 V m g cube. So, 4 V m g cube will be equal to P o to the power half multiplied by K ox and K ox is experimentally determined as a function of temperature. So, when you make these substitutions, so, so V m g would be your, so I write, write 4 V m g cube is equal to K ox multiplied by P o to the power half, uh, which means V m g is equal to 1 by 4 to the power 1 by 3 into k ox to the power 1 by 3 p o to the power 1 by 6. So, I can determine k ox from this expression as a function of temperature and I know p o 2 is equal to 0 0.21 atmosphere. So, if I make appro appropriate substitutions then what I get is V m g is equal to 2 into roughly 10 to the power 16 per centimeter cube. And this, this works out to about 0 0.6 ppm in mg 1 minus x o. So, this x would be 0 0.6 ppm okay? because uh, oxy, uh, magnesium deficient would mean mg 1 minus x, x is the level of deficiency and level of de deficiency is equivalent to vacancy of uh, magnesium and this works out to around 0 0.6 ppm. Uh, now, if you change the partial pressure of oxygen, so if you take P O 2 is equal to minus, uh, P, sorry, if you take P O 2 to be equal to 10 to the power minus 9, minus 9 M P A, in such a situation again you, 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 re, you recalculate and this gives to V M G concentration of about 2 into 10 to the power 15 centimeter per centimeter cube. <coughs> this is equivalent to 0 0.04 ppm in m g 1 minus x o. So, if you compare these two values in previous case we got 0 .0, 0 0.6 ppm and now we have got 0 0.04 ppm. So, by reducing the partial pressure of oxygen by about 9 orders of magnitude, 
we, we get only a difference of an order of magnitude uh, in the magnesium vacancy concentration. Uh, so, this is about magnesium oxide. So, here we see that when you change the pressure for example, at a fixed temperature of point rate of melting point, you do not see an appreciable change in the concentration of magnesium vacancies. On the other hand, if you take example of TiO2, now TiO2 is also an oxygen deficient oxide. So, <laughs> it is very prone to non stoichiometry. So, uh, the, uh, in this case, this is uh, let us say should modify a little bit TiO 2 minus x. So, this is going to have oxygen deficiency. In case of MgO, we looked at magnesium deficiency and here we look at oxygen deficiency. So, the, the, so the reaction is of course, the reduction reaction. So, 2 OO plus Ti at Ti site, they go to Ti interstitial plus O2. So, since oxygen has gone out, the titanium site is also lost and it has become an interstitial and this gives rise to 4 electrons. Okay. So, the electrical neutrality condition we know is equal to N e is equal to 4 of T i assuming the titanium interstitials are. So, and K r would be T i sorry T i i T i i multiplied by N e 4 into P o 2 and if you make this to be equal to, so this becomes uh, 256 T i i to the power 5 multiplied by P o 2. Okay. So, so T i i concentration becomes K r divided by 256 to the power 1 by 5 into p o to the power minus 1 by 5. Let me have a just look. Yes, minus 1 by 5. So, this would be your T i concentration. Now, I know that k r experimentally is determined as 6.55 multiplied by 10 to the power 22 into exponential of minus 960 kilojoule per mole divided by R t and this has a unit of MPa centimeter inverse. So, now again I take t is equal to 0 0.8 of T m and which is nothing but about 1690 Kelvin in titanium oxide. So, I work out so, if you put the value, this value of temperature, you can work out what is T, uh, what is K r and P o 2, let us say. Um, so, let us say in air, P o 2 is 0 0.21 atmosphere. So, if you work out T i now, so make sure you put the right units in every place, because units are very important and uh, what you get here is uh, 1.4 into 10 to the power 18 per centimeter cube. So, first of all if you compare the magnitude with respect to uh, magnesium, in case of magnesium we got around 10 to the power 16 uh, uh, centi per centimeter cube atmospheric pressure and here you have two orders of magnitude high. So, even at room even at atmospheric pressure at the same uh, temperature uh, that is 0.8 of melting point uh, titanium oxide has much more uh, two orders of magnitude higher defect concentration in comparison to MgO and this works out to roughly 93 ppm in TiO 2 minus x. So, this x is 93 ppm. Now, if you take PO 2 is roughly 10 to the power minus 9 mega Pascal same pressure uh, as in case of MgO and again at 0.8 of T m, then you work out what is k, k experimental will give you the value of k at 
and then you know what is T i expression. So, T i i would be under such condition is 4.18 into 10 power 19 per centimeter cube. So, you have seen that uh, although that although that change relative change in the magnitude at two pressures is only one or about one order of magnitude, but this is equivalent to roughly 0.27 percent in T i O 2 minus x. So, this x is 0 0.27 percent it is a significantly large number. Uh, so, because of this uh, reasonable uh, because of this large change, uh, large difference in the defect concentrations of two oxides that we have taken, TiO2 makes a excellent n-type conductor, but MgO does not. Uh, so, if, if you want to make MgO conducting, uh, you need to put impurities that is you need to work through extrinsic defects and that we have seen earlier uh, what happens when you put defects in uh, MgO. So, this I hope uh, clarifies some of the basics related to ionic defects. Um, now, we will look at uh, some of the fundamental things related to electronic disorder in the material. We have talked in very brief about electronic disorder and just by writing a defect reaction. Okay. Now, unlike intrinsic point defects uh, which are your uh, vacancies or uh, um, uh, interstitials or electronic defects are typically created by either thermal means or optical means, which means uh, what happens in these materials is basically uh, you have two types of materials one is semiconductor uh, and insulators and oxides typically form in any of these two categories and they are different from the metals in such a sense that they have a forbidden energy gap. So, this is your energy gap in the energy band diagram and this is E g which means nothing exists. So, this separates basically your valence band and this is your conduction band. So, this valence band is typically at 0 k would be filled and this would be empty. Okay. So, any conduction which has to take place in these materials having uh, a particular band gap. So, this this E g value of E g would be would be about typically uh, below 2.5 electron volt for semiconductors and greater than 2.53 electron volt for insulators. So, any electron if, if these guys have to conduct any electricity or any charge conduction has to take place, the electrons from the valence band which is here, they have to be excited across this energy gap to, to go there and as a result it gives rise to a hole. Now, this can this process which means the process which has to occur here, it can be thermal process or an optical process because you need to supply an energy which is at least equal to or higher than E g. So, that is where uh, so, that is why these these defects are little bit different in terms of. Uh, so, basically you can consider this energy band gap as an energy which is equivalent to your defect formation energy in terms of intrinsic point defects. In terms of intrinsic point defects, if you look at the statistical model, then in, in order to create certain number of defects, you need to overcome the energy barrier of defect formation energy that is delta H f. Now, here you need to overcome E g in order to create a electron hole pair or to create electronic disorder or electronic defects. So, defect density as a result is nothing but number of electrons or holes in the material and you can express in terms of per centimeter cube. And another th another thing that is uh, uh, of interest in these materials is something called as Fermi energy and this Fermi energy for intrinsic semiconductors sits at the middle of the band gap and the once the semiconductor or insulator starts becoming extrinsic which means you start putting in defect then this Fermi level moves up or down. So, if you want to if you make it n type the Fermi level will, will move up for n type and for 
uh, for p type it will move closer to balance wind and when you start putting in impurities then you also introduce something called as donor acceptor levels. So, this would be your acceptor level which means it will accept electrons from the valence band giving rise to large hole density in the valence band and this will donate its extra electron. So, this, this is typically for example, in, in silicon if you take in silicon your aluminum would be an acceptor because aluminum is plus 3 atom. So, it would attract an electro it will it will receive an electron from the valence band give creating a hole in the valence band. So, uh, the, so, this is an acceptor level which and this difference in the energy is very small it is of the order of few milli electron volts which can be easily which can easily happen at room temperature. Similarly, this level will be called as donor level. So, I can write this as E d I can write this as E a and again this uh, energy difference E c minus E d is very small is of the order of few milli electrons volts. So, that all the excess electrons from donors for example, P 5 plus phosphorus. So, electrons from the donor impurities can be excited into the uh, conduction band uh, without spending any extra energy at room temperature and this gives rise to large density of conduction electrons in the conduction band. So, and the Fermi energy is an energy. Uh, so, you know what Fermi energy is. So, when you plot for example, uh, so this is let us say E f this is E versus So, this is for from the Fermi Dirac statistics which means uh, all the energy at 0 k all the energy levels below Fermi energy. So, an F e would represent the uh, probability of occupation. So, what it basically tells you is that all the energy levels below E f are filled at 0 k and nothing above E f is filled. So, this is your 0. So, this is at 0 k and as you increase the temperature. So, at a finite temperature this will go through half. So, this would be your half point. So, number of electrons. So, the number of electrons from the levels just close to Fermi energy will leave and go into the adjoining bands. So, this would be your definition of Fermi energy. So, typically for an intrinsic semiconductor it sits right in the middle of the band gap. <coughs> Some of the band gap values for example, in case of semiconductors your silicon has about 1.1 electron volt, germanium has 0.7 electron volt uh, and in case of uh, oxides for example, zinc oxide has about 3.2 electron volt, magnesium oxide has 7.8 electron volt, uh, nickel oxide has roughly 4.2 electron volt, uh, iron oxide is close to 2.2 uh, something electron volt close to 2 electron volts your Fe 2 O 3 has about 3.1 electron volt barium titanate a very important material for many practical applications is about 2.8 electron volt and uh, so on and so forth silicon oxide for example, has large band gap of 8.5 electron volt TiO 2 has 3 electron volt and you can you can find many more values in the literature. Uh, so, these are some some of the band gap values. So, typically higher the band gap is less conducting the material is in the intrinsic state ok, unless you create defects from some of the means. So, uh, the, the defect concentration since we know that it depends upon uh, since we know that you have to provide enough enough energy uh, which is a thermal energy uh, to over thermal or optical energy in order to overcome the energy barrier. It can be written in terms of uh, probability of uh, electrons or electrons crossing uh, this gap. So, uh, so concentration of electrons or holes are equal in a intrinsic. So, N e is equal to N h in an intrinsic solid. And this is given as N e is equal to N c 
exponential of minus of E c minus E f divided by k t and you know what E c and E f is. So, this is your E c conduction band edge the bottom of conduction band and E v is top of valence band. Okay. So, N c where N c is the effective conduction band density of states. density of states and similarly n h is given as n v into exponential of minus of E f minus E v divided by k t. So, basically you can see that E f now for intrinsic semiconductor E c minus E f would be equal to for an intrinsic semiconductor E c minus E f is equal to E f minus E v is equal to half of E g because it sits right in the middle. So, you can see that this would change to minus of E g by 2 k t and this would also change to minus of E g by 2 k t and you can see as. So, if, if that is the case then as E g increases what would happen to N e and N h both N e and N h would decrease and also as temperature increases both N e and N h would increase and this N v I, I forgot to mention would be effective conduction slash valence band density of states depending upon which case you are referring to and N c and N v values are given as N c is equal to 2 into 2 pi m e star k t divided by h square and to the power 3 by 2 and n v is equal to 2 into 2 pi m h star k t divided by h square to the power 3 by 2 and m e star and m h star are effective mass of electron and, and this is effective mass of hole and k is Boltzmann constant h is Planck's constant and that you can. So, at about so at about 300 k which is roughly room temperature n c is equal to n v is roughly 10 to the power 19 per centimeter cube if m e star was equal to m h star okay, uh, which means mass of free electron effective mass of free electron is equal to free effective mass of hole. Now, uh, that is not necessarily a true condition, but just for the sake of uh, doing it. Um, we know that n e is equal to n h for an intrinsic semiconductor I can write E f to be equal to E c plus. So, if you make any and n h equal to what it becomes is that E c plus E v by 2 plus 3 by 4 k t ln m e sorry m h star divided by m e star and this E c plus E v by 2 is nothing but E g by 2. So, this becomes uh, so your E f becomes E g by 2 plus 3 by 4 k t ln m e m h star divided by m e star. So, if this was equal to 1 then E f was equal to E g by 2 for an intrinsic semiconductor this is what we assumed uh, to begin with. So, but typically in oxides your effective masses are are about 2 to 10 times of m e or uh, effective mass of free electron let us say m e naught which is the free electron mass. Okay. And uh, 
uh, you know that uh, atomic density of solids is roughly 10 to the power 23 per centimeter cube. So, density of states is about 4 and 4 to 5 uh, orders of magnitude lower than in semiconductors. So, uh, this gives you an idea about uh, the density of states value in semi in the oxides. Now, if Me and Mh were equal, then you can write Uh, Ne to be equal to Nh to be equal to Nc Nv to the power half into exponential minus Eg by 2 kT. Okay. Now, this expression is very similar to what you see for defect concentration. For defects, we worked out N by N is equal to exponential minus delta H f by k t 2 k t right. So, in case of Frenkel defects. So, you can see the relation here you need to overcome uh, energy of delta H f in order to create the defects here you need to create an uh, overcome an energy of E g in order to create electronic defects. So, it is uh, very very similar these expressions are very similar because the fundamental concepts are sim similar you need certain energy in order to overcome an energy barrier to create the defects. Okay. <coughs> so, density of electronic states in a, in a material can be can be thought of as equivalent to density of uh, vacancies in the lattice sites. So, expressions are equivalent that is why you can make them equivalent and the and the depiction in terms of chemical reaction if you want to in terms of chem in terms of so reaction of course, as we saw was electrons plus holes and this was for this reaction constant would be uh, N e multiplied by N h uh, which is equal to N c into N v into exponential minus E g by k t at about 300 k and this k i is approximately 10 raise to power 38 because this is 10 to power 19. Uh, so, this will be uh, 10 raise to power 38 exponential of uh, per centimeter cube. So, this would be 10 raise to power 38 uh, exponential minus E g by k t and this would be 10 to power minus 6. So, this is how you can determine what would be the values of uh, k i for intrinsic ionization. So, now, uh, uh, so in summary basically what we have seen is uh, for electronic disorder that the oxides typically have ionic solids or semiconductors covalently bonded solids they have an energy gap. In order to create electron and holes you need to overcome an energy which is nothing but the band gap and uh, depending upon how much energy you provide uh, you will create a certain electron concentration or hole concentration and this uh, equation is pretty much similar to the vacancy concentration or uh, Frenkel defect concentration that we worked out in case of equilibrium defect concentration. So, concepts are similar except that uh, the type of energies are different. So, now we will move on to some of the examples and uh, for example, we will take what is the um, uh, we will take the case of MGO and we will see uh, what is the intrinsic electronic and ionic defect concentration. So, what we will see is that because uh, the point here is just to see uh, which one dominates and uh, we will see later on that which one is more likely to be present in, in that particular environment. So, this is an example. Okay. So, consider so MGO as we know has short key defects and the defect formation energy delta H s is about 7.7 .7 electron volt. Since we since they have short key defects it, it is 7.7 .7 electron volt and the band gap E g is about 7. 
what we saw earlier uh, is about 7.8 electron volt and this band gap changes uh, as you as 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 you as you increase the, uh, temperature of mgo so this minus of uh, so basically your your band gap is going to decrease as you increase the temperature okay so the question is now in a completely pure and stoichiometry magnesium oxide which defects are likely to be created and uh, or who which defects are going to be going to dominate is it ionic or electronic so let us say uh, temperature so let us say temperature is equal to about 1400 degree centigrade and that is 1673 kelvin so we can write the defect uh, so intrinsic defects are vo and vmg so concentration of vo is equal to concentration of vmg and this is equal to nothing but your ks this is a short key defect cos short key defect reaction to the power half and this is nothing but equal to exponential of uh, we are taking it in this in mole fraction. So, exponential of minus delta h s by 2 k t and if you put in the value of delta h s and at this temperature this comes out to about 2.5 multiplied by 10 to the power minus 12 mole fraction ok. Now, how do you calculate the electron and hole concentration just use the formalism that we have used earlier. So, we know that N e is equal to N h is equal to k i to the power half which is equal to N c N v to the power half into exponential minus e g by 2 k t right and this would be given as 2 into k t to the power 2 pi h square into m e star into m h star to the power 3 by 4 to exponential minus e g by 2 so, what I have done is if you go to previous slides N, N c and N v were equal to yeah. So, what I have done is basically replace the value of N c and N v in, in those expressions. So, this is how it becomes and uh, in M g o we know that M e star is equal to 0.38 of M naught or M e, M e naught and m h star is equal to 0.77 m e naught. Typically, uh, effective mass of hole is much more higher as compared to effective mass of electron and what we find is um, an m e naught is equal to nothing but this particular thing is 9.1 into 10 to the power minus 31 kg. So, at, at the temperature of interest which is at 1673 Kelvin. Uh, you know that the band gap also changes. So, you need to work out what is the E g. So, E g will be equal to 7 point uh, how much was it? So, we have taken 7.8 7.8 minus the difference of 1673 uh, with respect to. Uh, so, that that value was given as at. Uh, so, basically delta t at 1673 minus room temperature multiplied by d by d t ok and this would be this would come out to approximately 6.2 electron volt and this would give you n e is equal to n h is equal to if you replace the value of temperature here take the Boltzmann constant take the Planck's constant 
M E and M H naught, we know what is E G and if you do that, you get about 4 into 10 to the power 10 per centimeter cube. So, now if you compare these two concentrations, here it is 4 into 10 to the power 10, to power 10 centimeter cube and in the previous case it was 10 to the power minus 12 mole fraction. So, the question now here is how to convert it to uh, per centimeter cube. So, V m g conversion into per centimeter cube. So, basically 2 into 10 to the power minus 12 mole fraction multiplied by you will have to multiply it by density of m g o in grams per c c multiplied by n a which is Avogadro number which is number per mole and this has to be divided by molecular weight of m g o which is gram per mole. So, if you do that this is 2.5 into 10 to the power minus 12 multiplied by density is 3.58 multiplied by N A 6.023 into 10 to the power 23 divided by molecular weight of M G O is about 40.3 and this would come out to around 1.4 into 10 to the power 11 per centimeter cube. So, if you compare these two magnitudes now here you get 4 into 10 to the power 10 and here you get 1.4 into 10 to the power 11. So, at, at, at 1400 degrees centigrade if you compare these two energies now if you if you look at the previous energies the energy the, at that particular temperature the defect formation energy 7.7 .7 electron volt and the band gap is about 6.2 electron volt. So, there is a difference of 1.5 electron volt, but it's still the defect concentration in M G O is uh, short key defects concentration is much larger is, is an order of magnitude about a larger as compared to electronic concentration. So, you can see that uh, at, at a particular given temperature which defects will dominate using this kind of analysis. So, uh, another thing that you would like to see is the role of uh, impurities, role of donors or acceptors. Now, when I make a band gap like this, this is your E c, this is your E v. I said that in a semiconductor when you put an impurity. So, an impurity which let us say A you put and if it becomes. So, A star let us say A or B. So, A dot. Uh, and it goes to let us let us say m site and if you put b b goes to m site if it gets reduced it will rise to a hole okay so this kind of impurity will be a donor impurity and this kind of impurity would be an acceptor impurity because it creates an hole so that typically the acceptor level is very close to as i just explained in the previous slide. This is your E A and this is your E D and the E V minus E D or E A minus E C are equivalent to or smaller than K T. So, basically of the order of few MeVs in a typical semiconductor. Okay. Now, in case of for example, um, in case of oxides if you form oxygen vacancies for example, O O goes out it gives rise to half O 2 which goes out gives rise to oxygen vacancy gives rise to two electrons. So, here formation of oxygen vacancy has given rise to two electrons which means oxygen vacancy acts as a donor impurity. So, the this would be in an oxide for example, oxygen vacancy and acceptor would be your for example, metal vacancy. So, if you have
if you have this reaction then this would be metal vacancy. Similarly, your oxygen interstitial would go at this site. So, acceptor levels would be typically metal vacancies and it ox uh, or cation vacancies and anion, anion interstitials and donor level would be your anion vacancy and cation interstitials. The, the difference in energy would depend upon the fact that how much uh, what is the level of ionization of these impurities or these defects whether they are singly ionized, completely ionized or neutral and this would det determine their uh, basically level of uh, uh, typically what you will find is that uh, uh, that as th as the ionization increases the energy also uh, the difference in the energy also increases so although we have taken most of the cases in in our uh, module as completely charged charged impurities and the the defects may not defects or impurities may not be completely ionized in case of impurity if you take for example in mgo Aluminium, if you are putting aluminium, then aluminium goes to magnesium site, this would be positively charged. So, donor, and if you put sodium, sodium at magnesium site, this would be negatively charged, giving rise to a hole. So, this would be acceptor. Now, the depending upon type of defects are created, level of their ionization. These uh, these energies, uh, the difference that the donor and an accept the distance of donor and acceptor levels with respect to conduction and valence band edge would change. So, for instance, in case of MgO, so this is your EC, this is your EV. In case of MgO, so uh, the, if your your VMG dash dash is about 1.5 electron volt, so this is EA and your this is your VO ED and this is about 2 electron volts and you know that in case of MgO the band gap is about uh, roughly let us say 8 electron volt is about 7.8 or 7.9 electron volt and depends on the temperature as well. So, this would be your EG minus ED plus E g minus E d minus E a and if you if so uh, here we are talking of so if you if you talk about V o x then this would be much more smaller about half electron volt. Uh, if you take singly ionized magnesium vacancy this would be roughly 0 0.5 electron volt. So, depending on the level of ionization the distance the difference in the energy levels would change and similarly if you put aluminum and sodium they would also introduce their energy levels respectively at various places. So, finally, um, we will just come to final topic now and final topic is just to consider electronic and ionic compensation of solutes. So, for example, you take the uh, which one is more preferable. So, example we take uh, of so ionic versus electronic compensation. So, example we take is N B 2 O 5 doping in T i O 2. Okay. So, what is the defect reaction? The ionic defect reaction would be So, ionic defect reaction means no electronic defects is created and defects are created. So, which means something is going to happen at cation site. So, you put 2 N B 2 O 5 I am going to write def balanced defect reaction. So, all those 4 niobiums go to titanium site which means uh, niobium is plus 5 titanium is plus 4. So, it is going to carry one positive charge plus all the oxygens go to oxygen site. So, now there is a problem here since all the 10 oxygen go to uh, that oxygen sites, but only 4 niobiums go to titanium site whereas, stoichiometry requires 1 cation site for 2 uh, anion sites which means I create a vacancy of titanium which would be 4 charged uh, minus 4 charged. 
So, this would be the side balance. So, in order to compensate for two extra oxygens which are coming uh, as a result of N B 2 O 5, you need to create one extra vacancy of titanium. So, this is a ionic defect reaction. Now, electronic compensation So, I can again write 2 N B 2 O 5, again all the 4 niobiums are going to titanium sites, oops, so mistake here, plus 8 O O X, X plus O 2, which means for 4 titanium sites, I take in only 8 oxygens, rest of the oxygens go out but now I have to balance the charge. So, which means I have to create 4 electrons. So, this is a, so let us say this is reaction 1 and this is reaction 2. So, if I now subtract the reaction 2 from reaction 1, then what I get is N B 2 N B 2 O 5 cancel each other and N B T I N B T I will cancel each other. What I will have is O 2 plus 4 E. So, 1 minus 2 gives rise to O 2 plus 4 E 2 O O X plus V T I. So, what this tells you is that as you increase the partial pressure of oxygen, the reaction will move into forward direction, which means at higher uh, at higher partial pressure of oxygen, your uh, formation of titanium vacancies is going to be preferred. Similarly, if you have lower pressure of oxygens, the reaction will push into the, uh, the backward reaction, which means electron electronic compensation is going to be favored at. So, high P O 2, you have ionic compensation, this is obvious from this reaction and low P O 2 will give rise to electronic compensation. So, this is pretty clear from this reaction. Now, similarly as you increase the temperature as you as you decrease the temperature oxidation is again favored. So, so temperature increases means oxidation increases. So, as you increase the oxidation then um, again formation of titanium vacancies is favored. So, you, you basically put in the more oxygen into the system. So, so, as now we can see, so, uh, um, so N B basically, so you can create conditions like if N B 2 O 5 concentration is large, P O 2 is high and temperature is low, all these conditions prefer ionic compensation and converse is true uh, in case of electronic compensation. In any case, you have to follow the new electrical neutrality condition. The electrical neutrality condition would be N B T I 4 V T I plus, uh, hang on just a second, let me just see the, what the reactions are. So, I have here N B T I is equal to electron, N B T V T I is equal to 4 of N B T I. So, N B T I is equal to so N B T I is equal to 4 of V T I, right. So, I will have so N B T I will be equal to 4 of B T I plus N E because you have 4 times. So, in case of ionic composition, it is 4 times the vacancy concentration in case of electronic composition it is equal. Okay. And similar effects you can see in oxides such as barium titanate etcetera. I can give you a home question uh, to work out. For example, you can do the same exercise for material like uh, titanium oxide. So, homework can be do the same for T i O 2 and for this you can refer the books which I have subscribed in the bibliography uh, related to 
Similarly, same is true about uh, uh, calcium oxide doping in zirconium oxide. Again, you can have electronic compensation or the ionic compensation. So, uh, I can I will leave it to you uh, to work out the defect reactions. Um, what happens uh, when you when you dope zirconia with calcia or yttria? Um, by this time, you should be pretty much familiar with how the defect reactions are written. And uh, the uh, one thing which I want to point out is that when you when you put all these dopants, for example, into the uh, host lattice, they give rise to a change in the volume. So, for example, when you dope zirconium oxide, so CaO in ZrO2, so the density of these materials also changes so at appreciable large concentration. So, when you put if cation interstitials are present, it is like this, but if anion vacancy is present, so depending on what kind of defect you have, you will have difference in the level of reduction, but uh, the volume changes are observed uh, and uh, as a result you have uh, volume or mass changes you can say, as a result you have changes in the density. So, basically density is the parameter which takes mass and volume both into account. So, uh, level of type of defect would decide the uh, change magnitude of change, but you have a change in the density when you start doping the material. Uh, if you want to go into details of these things, you should go to the uh, case studies given in the books, but uh, as you can understand. So, what we have discussed in this module is basically we have taken the defect equilibria. Uh, first of all, we started with the um, defect, how the defects are formed what are the various defect reactions, how we can treat these defect reactions as chemical reactions, the basis for that and then uh, and we also worked out how the equilibrium concentration of defects is calculated, what happens when you put impurities inside a particular material and then we uh, looked at the conditions, uh, the, con the concentrations of defects at various partial pressures of oxygen by creating the limiting conditions in high and low pressure range and created an equilibrium diagram. And finally, we took some case studies just to uh, see what kind of defects dominate in which kind of material. So, I hope this gives you a fair idea about the uh, second module, which would be instrumental in going to the third module, which is about now more applied in the sense that now you now we know about the defects, what sort of defects are going to form. What we will see in the next module is how these defects move and what sort of pop properties they give rise in ionic solids. Thank you. Thank you.